What sparked your interest in mathematics? Um, Richard Feynman once said that um, the reason for the usefulness of math is that the same equations have the same solutions. I didn't know Richard Feynman when I was um, becoming a mathematician, but I think that sentence summarizes very well how I felt about mathematics when I chose to study mathematics many, many years ago. And how did that inform your early research decisions? Basically, the same way. Um, I always felt that mathematics has a universality to it that I always found very, very appealing. So, uh, my choice of research topics were never motivated by the end objective um, at hand, but by the building blocks that you have to develop along the way. I always found that to be much more interesting. Um, it's been a long-term uh, relationship between me and math, always. And I always make my decisions uh, based on the long-term, never the short-term. And is there a specific reason for that? That's the way I am. So that's perhaps the best answer. Um, I, of course, I know many mathematicians, they all look at uh, math uh, in a different way. They all feel math differently. In my case, it was uh, the journey more than the destination that was the, uh, the objective of everything I did. And how did Charles Pfeffman become your PhD advisor? Um, I selected him and he agreed. Uh, now, I have to say, when I arrived at Princeton in, in 1985, I was, one thing was very clear to me, which is I wanted to look around. Um, I wanted to know all the professors, I wanted to know all the researchers before I made up my mind as to what I was going to do. I, it was very tempting to go there with a pre-specified objective as to what I wanted to do. I knew that I did not have enough information. I wanted to collect more information so I could make an informed decision. Uh, but I can say that it took me no more than a week or two to realize that well, he was different. Um, his approach to math was very much similar to mine, very personal, um, very much focused on the building blocks uh, where um, the objective was not the goal, it was the journey that made a difference. So there was this alignment of uh, feelings uh, between him and I and that drew me close to him from the first few days that I was at Princeton. The Chicago School of Analysis expanded through the influence of Alberto Calderon to include many Spanish-speaking students. Do you see how that history can lead to participation by other groups in mathematics? Yes, I think what they have done is remarkable, uh, truly remarkable. Um, from a mathematical point of view, they did something historical. Um, they developed tools that were completely new and managed to revolutionize uh, not one, but several fields. More than that, um, many of the mathematicians that were part of that school, they did not stay within the realms of the school for a very long time. They left that a group of problems they were working on to go and do other things. They were uh, explorers. Uh, they had developed um, a very unique GPS system or something that allowed them to leave what they were doing and very quickly dominate other fields. That was remarkable. Um, in my case, I was um, an heir to some of that um, I had, uh, I joined um, Charles Pfefferman when he was already outside of that initial uh, uh, field of activity. He was working on uh, mathematical physics at that point in time. He was perhaps the first, the, probably the first um, 
mathematical physicist to come out of the school of uh, Chicago school. So I had an advantage, which is I had already witnessed that first step in the evolution from that uh, core of uh, competence arising from the school and how that got to be used in areas that were uh, totally unpredicted uh, to any of the participants. That was a very uh, powerful uh, learning experience for me. And what was it like to be a student of Charles Beckman? If I have to explain, I'll have to use an analogy. Imagine you are at the Museum of Modern Art in New York looking at a Jackson Pollock that they have that goes wall to wall. You do that at the same time you are listening to Mozart's 41st Symphony and you're doing all of this while you're climbing Mount Everest on a mountain bike. That's probably the closest it feels to being a student of Charles Weber. And what research problems are you working on right now? My area of activity right now is focused on risk management, financial risk management, and financial asset management. Um, for those of you who may not know much about this, um, uh, these are fields that have developed within the financial sector somewhat independently over the last 50 years. Um, risk management has to do with the banking sector and what the regulators have done to the banking sector to mitigate losses as much as possible. Asset management is what uh, started in the financial sector maybe towards the beginning of the 20th century, which is what investors have been doing over the last 100 years. And what I'm interested in now is um, bringing those two fields under the same roof. I'm trying to come up with research themes which are asset management in their objectives but are risk management in their methods. And that is creating a very novel approach to risk management, one that I find fascinating, one that my students find fascinating, and one that led to the creation of, of a company that actually does that, manages assets from a risk management perspective. And within that, how do you choose the directions that you go in for research? I have a tremendous advantage, which is I run a company, a, a company that invests real money, a lot of real money. Um, that gives me a vision as to what's relevant, not from an industrial point of view, which is uh, very unique. I have the ability, I have the pleasure of being able to look at the problems that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and find these um, elements of, of math, which are underlying but hidden in a lot of those problems and for several years now this has been the main driver for a lot of the uh, research that takes place in my lab at the University of Toronto. How has your education in mathematics played a role in the field and the work you do now? In several ways. Um, if I go back to the phrase by Feynman that the same equations have the same solutions um, it is this universality of math that allows you to um, very quickly make analogies and uh, resolve problems um, in, in very unique ways. That has been one. Uh, but there's more, more than that. This ability that mathematicians have to um, look at a problem and figure out what's superficial to the problem and what's critical to the problem, to be able to strip off the, the problem of unnecessary complications is also a very good way of um, selecting 
uh, research problems, identifying research problems within an industrial environment, and providing some path for a possible solution. How should the quality of research be judged? That's a very difficult question. Um, research is playing a very new role in society now. Um, it used to be the case that research was always a long-term adventure. Um, the Renaissance uh, probably led to the Industrial Revolution, and the two are two, three hundred years apart. That was probably the time frame um, during which research activity became relevant in society. That time frame has, has shrunk to a very unusual, um, very unusual one in which it's very often now within the lifespan of a human life that we see inventions become um, practical. Um, it's becoming very difficult now uh, to judge research, but at the same time, research has an opportunity that never had before, which is its impact, its societal impact has risen tremendously. Um, this is creating waves of opinion as to how research should be judged. It's changing the way people react to research in good ways and in bad ways. On the one hand, um, it makes us more demanding on research because we do see that immediate benefit research can have. On the other hand, we run the risk of forgetting about the long term. And we need to realize that research is a long term activity. A good research activity must fail 99% of the time. And that must be understood. That's something unthinkable in medicine, for example. You cannot allow 99% of your patients to die. But in research, you have to. Otherwise, you're not taking enough risk. Research in today's world is perhaps the riskiest activity, and it should be that way. And when risk is so high, the stakes must be also very high. And that makes judging research a very, very difficult activity. What is your view on research being defined as basic or applied? I no longer believe in that distinction. Um, it's interesting that um, where that comes from, that distinction, it's interesting where that distinction comes from. As a mathematician, mathematics um, was not too different from what we would call engineering today up until 1850, more or less. In 1850, something very interesting happened, which is uh, mathematics started to develop internal paradoxes. Um, it's a very well-known example that um, Euler never believed the findings of uh, Fourier, uh, which we now we all know they are completely true. Um, that uh, drove mathematics into a crisis a crisis that took at least 50 years to resolve. This is the era uh, when mathematicians or logicians like Frege were wondering as to what the definition of a number should be. That was all the result of a crisis. But it created something very important, which was the distinction between pure and applied math. Pure math was the new math that was created as an attempt to put order into the chaos that math had become. At the same time, uh, the old path that mathematics was taking 
as a solution to everyday problems uh, continued, but it became more uh, what we would call engineering today. That bifurcation of disciplines is finished. Uh, math continues to have a short-term, medium-term, and long-term picture, which is relevant for any mathematician doing research. But I don't believe that there is such thing as a pure or applied math. And there's lots of examples that, that show that um, whereas something which is obviously a pure math advance very quickly leads to an application and vice versa, applied problems, they very quickly lead to, to um, fundamental developments. Uh, pure and applied math, I think, have become no more than poetic descriptions of a recent past, which um, I think is no longer with us. How do you see the practice of research evolving in the future? I see room for increasing amounts of collaborative research, especially as a mathematician. Uh, mathematics was a discipline that for years was um, married to a certain discipline. Uh, physics in the 20th century, engineering in the 19th century, that's finished. Um, uh, mathematics now has uh, very deep uh, relationships with many fields, uh, medicine, psychology. It makes mathematics the centerpiece for many fundamental developments in society today. And that's going to change. That's going to change the way we feel math. And that's going to change the way we judge math going forward. And how will we judge math going forward? Another difficult question. Um, math contains internal dynamics as a discipline, as a mature discipline, which will continue to be the driving force for mathematics evolution. But at the same time, math has relationships with many other disciplines that are breaking down walls of separation between disciplines. So it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging to be able to take both views into account. One, math as a discipline with internal dynamics that continues to drive forward, and math as um, a centerpiece of relationships of many other disciplines. Do you think it's possible to predict the research directions of specific disciplines? Impossible. Otherwise, it would not be research. Okay. Uh, you can predict many things, uh, but as I said earlier, research is the activity which is riskiest, is the activity where our uncertainty is at its highest. And it, it has to continue that way. Otherwise, it will not be research. The day where we can predict results, the day where we can predict evolution of everything, that day research would have died. Do you see mathematics playing a different role in industry in the future? Industry. In the 19th century, industry in the 20th century was based on the domination of physical space. In the latter part of the 20th century, certainly in the 21st century, uh, industries are now focused, successful industries are now more focused on the domination of mental space. Facebook, Google, even Apple, um, they've realized that successful businesses need to thrive in mental space. Mathematics was relevant in industry and in society as the computational partner for the domination of physical space. 
and it was very well suited to do that, usually with engineering as the partner. Um, in the 21st century, that's no longer needed. Um, math is very well equipped to, to, to be a first role partner in the domination of mental space. And therefore, companies are finding mathematicians to be um, much more useful in their um, everyday struggles to innovate, to be better than the others, and to dominate that mental space where they expect to succeed.